I got a haircut. So I've decided I'm just gonna keep growing my hair. But it was looking a little crisp, okay? So I got a trim and I brought back my He-Man bangs because I love them. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back. In today's episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Crew Trime, I get it, you guys like it. This is the story of the Starbucks murders. Also, I wanted to remind you guys about the Crew Trime merch. It's available on t-shirts, it's available on mugs, and it's available also on a hooded sweatshirt, which is the only hooded sweatshirt in my merch shop. So, first things first, let me clip my damn bangs out of my face. Here's the downside to bangs. Does that look real stupid? Yeah, sure does. Okay, so you guys really like Crew Trime. I hear you loud and clear. If you are new here, welcome. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I am going to tell you a Crew Trime story while I put on my makeup. Everybody's doing it. This is the story of the Georgetown Starbucks murders. This is a doozy, okay? It's a long one. I have about eight pages of notes. You guys like the Crew Trime videos. I get it. I like them too. I'm gonna do more of them. Cause this is a lot of work. It's a lot of research. I'm committed to giving you what you want. So early, early, like before dawn on the morning of Monday, July 7th, 1997, three employees of the Starbucks coffee on Wisconsin Avenue, Northwest Washington, so upper Georgetown, were found dead. Among them were Katie Mahoney, aged 25, Emery Evans, also aged 25, and Aaron Goodrich, 18. They were found inside. Uh, two of them were kind of in the cold storage area and Katie was found in the hallway, but they had all been shot. So 18 year old Aaron Goodrich lived in Northwest Washington with his father, Larry, who he was super duper close with. And his father had actually helped him get that job at the store just a few months before. And 25 year old Emery, he lived in Northeast Washington and he worked there part-time among other jobs. So he was saving money to pay for his tuition to Howard University where he had planned to major in music. 25 year old Mary Mahoney, she went by Katie. She lived in Northwest Washington and she was the night manager of the store. She was a super bright young woman. She grew up in the Baltimore area and graduated from Towson University. She was described as a super kind hearted and compassionate person. And she took a lot of pride in her job there at Starbucks and she was often seen even sweeping the sidewalk out front of the store. The only thing that she didn't dig about working at Starbucks was, you know, when you're the manager, you have to discipline the employees. And she recently had to fire somebody because they had been, well, suspected of stealing money. So it was the early morning shift employee who discovered the bodies from the store. As soon as she saw them, she ran outside and like flagged down a bus that was driving by and the Metro bus driver called the police immediately. The homicide detectives combed the area for hours. They blocked off the streets and interviewed some of the neighborhood residents. And one witness said that he visited that Starbucks daily and said that the lights in the store were on when he passed by at about 10 p.m. the night before, but it was weird because the store is typically dark after 8 p.m. on Sundays. The 1800 block of Wisconsin Avenue Northwest typically has a lot of vehicle traffic and pedestrian traffic, but on Sunday evenings, it's typically pretty quiet. Other neighborhood witnesses said that they never heard any gunfire, which would have been impossible because that area is so compact and tightly populated. So that means that the shooter likely used a silencer. There was also no video surveillance evidence available because it was 1997. <laughs> I, I think I've, I've talked about Georgetown before in other crew crimes, just sort of briefly. Georgetown is like a super old part of Washington DC. It's a neighborhood that's very boutique, upscale, safe. There's no violent crime there. There's no, nothing ever happens there like that. Probably petty theft or maybe even some robberies, but definitely not a triple homicide at the Starbucks. No money was taken from the store. Hmm. So the recently fired employee, the one who was let go for stealing, was investigated immediately. I mean, th the person who found the bodies was like, yeah, I think I might know who might've done this. So they investigated that person quickly. Turns out that they were out of town when it happened. They had a pretty solid alibi. It wasn't them. So when this event occurred in 1997, Starbucks, 
had 62 stores in the DC area and only 10 were actually in the city limits. Now there's over 91 Starbucks just in the city limits. So of the 1200 locations around the world at that time in 1997, this was the very first murder ever to happen in a Starbucks. Not that there's a lot of them that happen, but this was the first one. So despite all the police investigation and the crazy publicity that this case was getting, it was largely not going anywhere. It wasn't going well. There started to um, be these kind of wild theories popping up, particularly around Katie. So Katie was an intern at the White House during the Clinton administration, during the Monica Lewinsky scandal. So there was some unfounded speculation about, you know, maybe Katie knew too much about the Lewinsky thing and she had been taken out. Anyways, nothing ever came of that. It doesn't seem to be connected. We're, we're getting to what really happened. <laughs> okay, so like I said, the case was not any closer to being solved. It was really sort of going nowhere. So an episode of America's Most Wanted aired a segment about this case, the unsolved Starbucks murders, and they even offered a Starbucks funded $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of whoever did this. After that aired, a woman called with a tip saying that she was dating a man who was friends with a man who had admitted to being the Starbucks killer. And that guy's name was Carl Cooper. Sorry if it's extra noisy, I've got the door open because it's so nice outside. A little fresh air in here, you know? Anyway, so the woman worked with police. She wore a wire and continued some down low conversations with her boyfriend to try to get a little bit more information about this Carl Cooper. Police teamed up with the FBI and some other local law enforcement who were already sniffing around on Carl Cooper from his involvement with some other unsolved crimes and they had already connected him as a suspect in the Starbucks murder. Hmm. Carl D. Cooper, at this time, he was aged like 29. He lived with his mother, his wife, and his young son in Northeast Washington, DC. He was a career criminal and he was very much already known to Metro PD. He had a very long record of armed robberies. He was pretty much like the ringleader of a robbery ring that they were already working to try to nab. So they had been building a case on him for quite some time, but that he was just so heavily insulated by the way that his little crime ring was set up. It was very elaborate, okay. Anyways, so once they had that tip from the woman, they were really able to move in on him uh, for the Starbucks case because they had already tapped his phone, surveilled his home, and questioned everyone that they could connect to him. When the police are asking all your friends and stuff about you, it gets back to you. So he knew, he knew what was up. So on March 1st, 1999, two years after the Starbucks murders, Cooper drove up to his home with his five-year-old son in the car and the police were already there waiting to arrest him. Well, the arrest warrant was based on his alleged involvement in an attempted murder from a 1996 shooting of an off-duty Prince George's County, PG County police officer named Bruce Howard. What does it have to do with, it doesn't, it doesn't. We'll get there. They took Cooper to the FBI field office in DC. He got there at about 8 p.m. and he was there until about 4 a.m. the next day being questioned. He told the investigators that he was worried about the effect of this arrest, how it could affect his job. He didn't have a job, okay? He was a criminal. He said that all the evidence that they think they had on him was circumstantial and he wanted to take a lie detector test. We all know what happens when you take a lie detector test. Okay, so in the initial hours of the questioning, investigators weren't sure if Cooper was talking about the shooting of Officer Howard or the Starbucks murders or some other aspect of the case. So when they made it clear, we're, we're here to talk about Starbucks right now. He was upbeat, positive, cooperative. He signed his Miranda waiver without hesitation. He told them he was not involved, 100% not involved. Murder was not his style. He admitted to past involvement in robberies and drug crimes and all that stuff. Train. So like I said, he definitely admitted his involvement in lots of other crimes. <laughs> he knew, he said, that he was confident that his name was only coming up for the Starbucks case because of the shady people that he'd helped or been associated with in the past. He, he said he was a robbery consultant. Maybe somebody got nabbed and was trying to work out their own deal. 
to help themselves. Cooper said that he had been to that Starbucks location before, but not the weekend that the murders occurred, which was 4th of July kind of weekend. He said that he never knew anybody who worked for Starbucks. He never worked for Starbucks. He would never commit a crime in Georgetown because it's way too busy. He had spoken to another crime associate that had approached him about the best way to go about robbing that Starbucks, which he said he advised not to do for the same reason. Georgetown's way too busy. You'll never get away with it. Don't, don't bother. We all know Starbucks is a coffee shop, right? Did I even need to say that? Okay. You never know. So as the evening progressed there at the FBI field office, about four hours into the interrogation, Cooper started to get concerned about being perceived as a snitch. So he started to get emotional, even crying, and he entered what is called the despondent phase, where a suspect kind of wants to admit what they've done. Cooper started going on about being in it for life, destined to do dirt, and he was constantly trying to defend his name. I didn't do this shit, I didn't do the PG shit. And when investigators asked if he still wanted to take a polygraph, He's like, no, there's no point. Agreed. Okay, so this went on, investigators trying to sort out which crimes they could get Cooper to admit to. He named a few associates, but he only would admit to like after the fact knowledge, right? Of specific crimes, including that shooting of the off-duty police officer in Prince George's County. And by 3.30 in the morning, the interrogation was done for the night. So the next day, Cooper was extradited to Prince George's County to be questioned further about the police officer. As soon as he got in the police car, he started talking about stuff that they weren't there to talk about. Like he really wanted to talk about Starbucks and they listened. Anyways, once he was there at PG County, the police told him that they had witnesses and ballistics that implicated him and he quickly replied that it was not my gun used in the shooting. Okay. He said that the DC police switched the barrels and were trying to frame him. And the police explained that uh, guns are identified by the firing pin and not the barrel. And Cooper said he wanted to prove that he was not involved in that Starbucks case and he would talk about Officer Howard later. My guy, you are being questioned right now in Maryland by Maryland police about a Maryland shooting. But, but okay. So now with Cooper back on task, the detective explained to him that he was being charged with the robbery and shooting of Officer Howard. So he elaborated that Officer Howard, who was off duty, and a woman were embracing in a parked car in a wooded park area when someone attempted to rob them and he was shot in the process. And Cooper said that PG County already had the gun and then gave the detective his version of events. And Cooper agreed to provide a written statement, which became the first of seven written statements. Cooper said a while back, he had been walking home late at night, like between midnight and 4 a.m. late. He was walking through the woods and he noticed a parked car with a man and woman inside having sexual relations. So he walked up to the car to be nosy and he noticed a wallet in the back pocket of the man who was lying on the front seat with his pants down. Now hold up. <laughs> How do you see the wallet in the back pocket of pants that were down inside a car? Anyway, so the woman saw him approach and she screamed, of course. So the man rolled off of the woman and yelled at Cooper to take their money, but please don't hurt them, right? So Cooper pulled out his gun and the man agreed to give him the money. But when Cooper leaned into the car, the man punched him in the face. Good. And he got a hold of his gun and turned it around and it went off. The bullet m missed him, but it shot through the window of the car. Once Cooper regained control of the gun, the man had got out of the car and he started beating the shit out of him. And in the process, the gun went off again. And he noticed, Cooper noticed that the man wasn't gravely injured, so he just ran off. He like heard sirens and police cars and saw lights and stuff. So he was like, oh, he's fine. He didn't learn until the next day that that was actually a police officer. So Cooper later corrected that statement saying that he actually drove up to that scene in his mother's car with his friends, Ernest and Smokey. The group intended to shoot guns in the woods when they noticed this parked car and then they decided to rob the people inside. And Cooper approached the car while his friends waited. Old Carl Cooper was real talkative. Okay, he had a lot to say and he really liked 
I guess, talking about himself because he was really spilling the beans, man. He gave another statement about several robberies, one involving him dressing like a woman to rob a bank in Maryland, another robbery at a massage parlor, the murder of a security guard, some drug deals, and another drug-related murder. Oh, and he did all of this with no lawyer. Okay, so at no point did he ever ask for one, and he signed multiple Miranda waivers. You guys know what Miranda waivers are, right? You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can blah, 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 blah. We all know this. Yes. Okay, so after discussing those robberies and things to come clean and show cooperation, the investigators brought up the Starbucks shooting, and he started to sweat. So one investigator said, it's interesting how you and one of the victims both knew a man named Keith Covington. So Cooper was like, oh. thought for a second, composed himself, and then he started singing like a canary, right? It was an inside job. Keith was the mastermind. He was only there to be the driver. Cooper had so much to say on that matter that he ended up writing three statements about the Starbucks murders. Now, before we continue, let's just recap, okay? In case you're confused, because I got a little confused too. Police had their eye on him. Once they had something solid on him, they took him to the FBI field office to question him. He started talking about Starbucks and it wasn't until the next day when he went for additional questioning in PG County that they really got into the Starbucks stuff and the Officer Howard shooting and all of these other things that they didn't even know about. So there's, there's three different statements. Here's statement number one. Keith Covington approached him about a month before with the idea of robbing that Starbucks in Georgetown. He had a friend that worked there that could be like the inside guy to get the employees to cooperate. And then Cooper could be the getaway driver. Since it was an inside job, Cooper did not bring a gun and he never got out of the car. So he said that Covington was inside the store for like, I don't know, 15, 20 ish minutes. And then he ran back out to the car and they sped away. And when he asked, where's the money? How much money did you get? That old Covington looked up with a frowny face and said, I didn't get it. So Cooper dropped him off and they never spoke of it again. He said he learned about the murders the next day on the news like everyone else. And he was afraid to say anything because he was afraid that Covington would come after him because he was so, you know, violent and dangerous. Okay, now statement number two, both he and Covington walked into the Starbucks. Covington was armed. He put a gun to his friend's head, the inside job guy, told him it was a robbery and told the other two employees to cooperate. Cooper went upstairs to check it out and make sure there was nobody else up there. Uh, this particular Starbucks has like a rooftop terrace seating area, like outside. And then when he went back downstairs, Covington was arguing with the female employee. She didn't want to give him the key to the safe. When he went to the door to like make sure the coast was clear or whatever, he heard the gun go off. So then Covington went into the back room with the other employees. There was more gunshots and then they ran out together. He said he never fired his gun at all while they were inside the store. They didn't speak in the car at all. And after he dropped off Covington, they never spoke of the event again. He said that violence was just not his style. There was nothing he could do for those people in the Starbucks, but he was sorry for their deaths. Okay, so Carl Cooper's memory. It's a little foggy, I guess. He does know for sure that it's everyone else's fault, not his fault. So at this point, police revealed to Cooper that they had spoken to Keith Covington. They had questioned him for about 15 hours. He denied everything. He took a polygraph test. He passed. He acknowledged knowing one of the victims, adamantly denied any involvement because he was at home recovering from a gunshot wound to the stomach. <laughs> Rock solid alibi. Now we're getting to the good stuff. Statement number three. First of all, Keith Covington was not involved at all. Shocker. Carl Cooper had spent about a month planning to rob the Georgetown Starbucks. He had invited a friend, Ernest, remember Ernie and Smokey in the car? So he had invited Ernest to help him out. And that friend, Ernest, who definitely ratted him out to police months before, they already knew all this. He said that he agreed to come, um, you know, help him out with that robbery, but that Cooper never called him. So he didn't go. He didn't even know he was still doing it. Cooper 
you know, professional robber. He wanted to make sure that, that Starbucks was gonna have a ton of money when he went to go rob them. So he intentionally planned it for the Sunday after a busy holiday weekend. He visited the store that morning to make sure that it was good and busy. And when he arrived later that evening to rob the store, he announced himself, this is a robbery. He forced the three workers into the rear office where the safe was located. The safe had like over $10,000 in it and he demanded the keys. When Katie refused to hand over the keys, Cooper fired a warning shot into the ceiling and then Katie ran into the hallway. Cooper ran after her and was trying to get the keys from her and he ended up shooting her five times. He then turned and shot Emery and Aaron. Aaron was killed immediately. The gunshot passed through both of his lungs and his heart. Emery was on the floor crying and groaning, of course, in pain. Cooper shot him two more times in the head, killing him. Then without grabbing any money, he ran out. He raced across town, he ditched the guns, he took his car to the car wash, and he took his clothes off and washed them. Cooper's account of what happened definitely matched the forensic evidence and the ballistics. Police had found that bullet in the ceiling and they found 10 shell casings around the store. The shooting pattern that he described definitely um, was consistent with the autopsy reports. All right, bangs. So Cooper was arrested, formally charged, and transported back to DC to be presented to the Superior Court of DC the next morning, where he told the FBI that he admitted to everything under the sun. Whatever they told me to say, I said it. They didn't advise me of my rights. Oh, really? Cooper said that he totally embellished all of it. He denied everything, and then he finally asked for a lawyer. My dude, there is like a literal stack of Miranda waivers that you signed in statements that you hand wrote. It's a little late for the Sixth Amendment, but okay. So anyway, our junior lawyer, Carl Cooper, he was trying some legal gymnastics at this point, thinking that he could basically recant everything. He said that he had been deceived and coerced and treated poorly. And all of that was the basis for his motion to suppress all of the evidence. <laughs> all of the evidence that had been collected from his home, the surveillance, testimony from witnesses, people that identified him in photographs, phone conversations from the wiretap of his home, like the entire case file. <laughs> Motion to suppress. Motion denied. Oh, I am, my nose is running as per usual. So in the trial, that started the following February, Carl Cooper entered a plea deal on nearly 50 counts that included several charges of racketeering, that whole robbery ring, you know, organized crime, robbery, and the Starbucks murders. That really makes my teeth look like corn. The plea deal that he entered into protected his wife and mother from being connected in any way, charged with anything lesser that was connected because of him. Let's do it. Let's do this intercorner. He is currently serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole in a maximum security prison. Just a side note about Starbucks. We all sort of, you know, poke fun at Starbucks being like this soulless, ginormous, money grubbing corporation. But in the wake of this crime, especially it being the first super violent crime to ever occur at a Starbucks, they did right by these families. They paid for all of the funerals and they paid each family a lump sum. In this particular store, when they reopened the location, 100% of the profits from this location as a living memorial, they all go to charity. It goes to the Starbucks Memorial Fund, which locally supports over 60 nonprofit organizations in the greater Washington area that work with communities affected by violence of all kinds. So it's an all around terrible story, but it is doing some good over 20 years later. That is the story of the Georgetown Starbucks murders. This one has been requested a lot, so I hope I did it well for you. Don't forget to check the description box for all of the products that I used on my face today if you're curious and for the link to the merch store if you wanna get you some Crew Tribe merch. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you wanna see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on most of the other social channels. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye. Somebody gave me a tip on how to put in eye drops properly.
Thank you. I've been doing it wrong my entire life. But they had spoked. Spoked. Uh. Excuse me. Yep, right here, crew trend. Wow, I've got big old flakes of skin on my lips. That looks gross. There's a train going by, running my life. Cations, profit, fuck. Oh, wow. That is silver. The investigating, or. Er, <laughs> Do you hear that train? It's so dramatic. Hold, please. I don't know what kind of makeup I want to do. Oh, the George, George, George sweatshirt. It's act. Shut up. 